Hello and welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode 26, Attila the Hun. In 378 CE, Emperor Valens managed to get a peace treaty out of the Persians, a very costly peace treaty, and marched back west with his army, ready to deal with the Gothic invaders once and for all. Now the Roman Emperor in the west was marching his army to meet with Valens and to kill every single Goth they came across, like they had vanquished their enemies in the past, killing all the men and selling the rest into slavery. However, in the winter of 378, a Gothic army marched across the Rhine River that was completely frozen over and went straight into Roman territory, raiding and pillaging as they went. The Roman emperor in the west suddenly found himself fighting in his own land and could not come to the aid of Emperor Valens. Hearing that an army of 10,000 Goths led by Fritigar was marching on Adrianople, Emperor Valens sent his army out there to deal with them. 10,000 Goths was something his legionnaires could easily handle, so he wasn't too worried. However, he didn't know at the time that there were two other Gothic armies on their way to join Fritigar. Several priests were sent across the lines from the Goths to the Romans, asking for peace and the recognition of Fritigar as the king of the Goths. However, these requests were rejected, as Emperor Valens still thought his Western Roman allies were on their way. With the two armies facing off against each other in multiple parties on both sides trying hard to sue for peace, a couple of Roman legionnaires defied orders and charged the Goths. This triggered an unorganized assault without any proper formation. Now the fighting continued into the night and the Goths made giant fires on the edge of the battlefield that blew thick smoke into the enemy lines. The Romans unleashed a full attack and charged through the smoke, crashing into the Gothic army, pushing them back. The Romans had the momentum and smashed into the Goths, and they were chasing them down and slaughtering them when the other two Gothic armies and the small band of Huns that were working with them came crashing into the Romans from the side, completely destroying their ranks. With the raging fires and smoke blowing onto the battlefield, the Goths and Huns chased down the Romans, cutting them down or shooting them full of arrows. The result was a complete and chaotic retreat. However, for most of them, all hope of retreat was lost as the Romans were surrounded by horse archers who picked them off one by one. In this chaotic battle of smoke and fire, almost every single Roman soldier was killed on the battlefield, including the Eastern Roman Emperor Valens. In 379 CE, a new emperor was sworn into the east to deal with the crisis on the border of Constantinople, Emperor Theodosius. He was the exact emperor the empire needed at this time. And he took his army and marched straight out to war. In 380 CE, in the Macedonian city of Thessalonica, Emperor Theodosius met the Goths in battle. The results were another stunning defeat for the Romans, as the Goths overwhelmed the newly assembled army of ill-trained recruits. The Goths continued the pillaging, taking the treasures from the rich Roman cities in northern Greece and the Balkans. In 381 CE, dealing with revolt back in the capital, of Constantinople, Emperor Theodosius handed control of the campaign over to the Western Roman Emperor, who eventually ran the Goths out of Thessaly. Meanwhile, the, the Gothic king Athanaric returned from his fighting in the Carpathian Mountains with the Huns and signed a peace treaty with Emperor Theodosius. In 382 CE, the peace treaty was finally signed. Much of the rights that Fritigar originally asked for were granted. He was recognized as king of the Goths by the Romans, and he was allowed to stay in the Roman territory to settle his people. Even though this was a Roman defeat, the settled Goths secured the northern border from further barbarian invasions. However, this set a terrible precedent, and other tribes on the northern frontier would see this as proof that they too could break through the Roman borders and set up their own kingdoms inside of the greatest state Europe had ever known, the Roman Empire. For the first time, the Romans got to see the Huns with their own eyes. The Huns were alien to the Romans, who had been used to fighting traditional German barbarians for centuries. 
Until now, they did not even know these people existed. The Huns were different. They looked different, and they acted different. And they were far more dangerous than any barbarian they had ever faced before. The Huns lived on their horses. Their clothes were tattered fur, tied together. Their faces were scarred, and they lived in the elements. Many Romans thought they were dealing with a different group of subhumans. It felt like the apocalypse, and the clergy claimed the Huns were sent here because of God's wrath. To the citizens of the Roman Empire, it felt like the end of times that the Christians had been preaching about all this time. As stories of the Hunnic attacks on the outer provinces made their way to the capital, the people began to panic. To have your village attacked by the Huns was a living nightmare. They would ride in fast on horseback and set fire to every building within seconds. And as the people fled their huts and houses to escape the flames, the Huns would pelt them with arrows and cut them down with swords while galloping through the burning village. No one was spared. Even the animals were killed. Whenever a Roman army was assembled to meet the Huns in battle, the Huns would gallop up and rain thousands of black arrows upon them, usually breaking up their ranks before the Romans could even engage them in battle. The Huns would harass them and then break away and come back just as fast and spray them with another thousand arrows and then ride away again. What made the Huns' arrows more deadly than anything seen before was the reflex bow designed by the Huns' ancestors and passed down from generation to generation. This bow was bent the opposite way and made from crushed bone, hide, and horse glue. The result was an extremely powerful shot that required very little pull. The Huns were taught how to ride and fire the bow at the same time, and they were taught how to walk and speak. They were seemingly invincible. The Hunnic Empire now covered the entire frontier north of the Roman Empire, and the Gothic tribes that once lived in those regions had now flooded into the Western Roman Empire. And because of the Roman practice of relocating Germanic tribes into the empire and conscripting their men into the army, there were just as many Goths in the Roman army as there were flooding in from the frontier. Even with the Goths fighting in the Roman army, defending the Latin rulers from the capital, they still treated the Goths like barbarians, and the resentment started to grow within the Gothic Roman soldiers. Some of the Roman generals even hated Rome, and were itching to get revenge for the centuries of horrible treatment and mass enslavement of their people. One of those Gothic generals was named Alaric. In 394 CE, Alaric fought with the Roman armies against the Franks and lost almost 10,000 of his men. And yet the Romans didn't even recognize him for their sacrifices. In 395, Alaric left the Roman military and joined the Visigoths, where they elevated him to be their king. He was marching upon Constantinople with his entire army when he was confronted by an enormous Roman army and diverted south away from Constantinople and into southern Greece. He sacked the port of Athens, as well as the cities of Corinth, Megara, Argos, and Sparta. He terrorized the local Greek population in a part of the world that had been mostly peaceful and untouched by war for centuries, stripping them of their wealth and carrying it off to their camps. With a home base in the Balkans, Alaric set his sights on Rome. In 401, Alaric attempted an invasion across the Adriatic, into mainland Italy, but was defeated by the Roman general Stilicho. He was forced to retreat back to his camp in the Balkans and try again the next season. In 402, Alaric attempted another invasion. Again, this invasion failed, but he managed to deal heavy damage to the countryside and managed to get a tribute from the Senate in order to have him leave. Alaric returned back to his camp once again, but was as determined as ever to cross the Adriatic and sack the Eternal City. In 408, the Western Roman Emperor executed his commander Stilicho, who had defeated Alaric twice in battle already because of a rumor floating around that Stilicho had been making secret deals with Alaric. The Western Roman Emperor then stirred up and incited a riot in the city of Rome, that led to the mass murder of all the wives and children of the Gothic soldiers serving in the Roman army, who were housed within the Eternal City. 
Now, I'm no expert, but I have a suspicion that was probably the worst thing they could have done. Because immediately word spread to the Gothic soldiers serving in the Roman army, whose entire job was to keep Alaric from invading Italy, and they abandoned their posts all at once and defected to the Visigothic king, Alaric. The 30,000 Gothic soldiers marched to the gates of Rome, where the Senate paid them off with most of the gold in their treasury, and agreed to free all 40,000 Gothic slaves still living within the city. On May 1st, 408, on the other side of the empire, Emperor Theodosius II was declared the emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire at age 7, after his father Arcadius died at the young age of 31. Obviously, he was too young to rule over the empire in such critical times. He had a regent governed for him named Anthemius. He was fairly effective in his early years and even addressed the food shortage and worked out a new shipping agreement with Egypt to make sure they could keep up with the grain demands. He rebuilt entire communities that had been ravaged during the Gothic Wars, allowing the peasants to return to their land in Illyria. Anthemius even forgave a lot of backdated taxes that were decades behind, cleaning up the books and starting fresh. Anthemius' time in office really helped stabilize the crumbling Roman administration. In 410, talks between the Western Roman Emperor and the Visigothic King broke down, and Alaric, with his gigantic army of angry Goths, literally foaming at the mouths to get revenge for the betrayal and mass murder of their wives and children, marched upon the gates of Rome. Alaric demanded the Romans give them land along the Danube to settle his people, and the Romans refused. On August 24th, the gates were opened by slaves who sided with Alaric, and hordes of barbarians wielding swords flooded into the Eternal City for the first time in almost a thousand years. Anyone caught on the streets was cut to pieces, man, woman, or child, it did not matter. However, only a few homes were raided and stripped of their belongings. And although there were fires set, the entire city was not razed to the ground, like the Romans had often done to so many other cities. This sacking was more of a message from the Goths to the Latins. Treat us with respect and give us our rightful and dignified land within the empire to settle, because we have the ability to march into Rome whenever we want and can destroy the eternal city if we choose to. Alaric was also an Arian Christian and treated the sanctimony of the churches with respect. So anyone who fled into the churches and sought sanctuary was spared from the atrocities during the sacking. When he left, he took with him thousands of pounds of gold and silver and valuable silks and furs, as well as thousands of pounds of precious pepper. Although Rome was no longer the capital of the Roman Empire, the city was a symbol of the empire, and its sacking signaled Armageddon for the citizens of the empire. It really felt like the end of the world. However, the world did not end, and most of the barbarians who fled into the Western Roman Empire were merely trying to settle and find some sort of peace after their mass suffering and migration from their ancestral homes. Now, one incident that proves this is a written record from a Roman citizen who caught word that the Goths were invading his land. So he sent his entire family ahead of him to hide. He thought the horde of Goths was going to burn his land to the ground and murder everyone they saw, and was shocked when he received a written request to buy a piece of his land to settle his family upon. It showed the beginning signs of the Germans not just wanting to live in Roman lands, but to actually become Romans themselves. Many German settlements started to model themselves after Roman cities, and even called themselves Roman. And this trend would continue until the birth of the Holy Roman Empire in the later parts of this millennium. As the Western Empire slowly dissolved, the Eastern Roman Empire continued to power through the crisis. In 413, Anthemius, regent to the Eastern Emperor, saw the completion of his greatest achievement, the Theodosian Walls. Until now, the capital of Constantinople was protected by the Constantine Walls. These new walls were erected further out and they stood much taller. 
They were three walls deep with trenches between each, and the last wall over 40 feet tall. These walls had parapets to protect them from archers and were lined with fortress towers. When this wall was properly manned, it was impenetrable. These are the very walls that will keep the Roman Empire from collapsing for another thousand years. In 414, Anthemius passed away, and Theodosius' older sister became the regent over the Eastern Roman Empire. Her name was Pulcheria. She was a devout Christian, and even swore a vow of virginity. And because of this, she was praised by the patriarch of the church. Because Pulcheria and her two sisters were very religious, they governed the court in a very pious and modest manner. It was more set up like a church than it had been under previous Romans. The Roman court became packed with bishops and members of the church. The empire was quickly becoming a Christian empire. All the while, young Theodosius was spending most of his time as a child and youth in the library. His passion was reading old Greek manuscripts, and he quickly developed a passion for taking ancient scrolls and writing them into books. In 415, the radical conversion to Christianity brought some of the worst out in bishops, particularly the Alexandrian bishop Cyril. He wanted to elevate Alexandria's status in the Christian empire, so he sought to whip up anti-paganism in the city and wipe it out completely. The mob he created sought out and seized a Hellenic philosopher, astronomer, and mathematician who was a pagan, but also a woman, named Hypatia. Hypatia was an esteemed scholar and teacher and had written many works. She was on her way home, riding in her carriage when a mob of Christians attacked her dragged her out of the carriage and into a pagan temple. There they took turns cutting off pieces of her skin and even cutting out her eyes before they severed her limbs and carried the many pieces of her out of the temple and burned them in the streets. The news horrified the pagans in Alexandria and riots broke out between the pagans and the Christians. Many believe that the order to kill Pipatia came directly from the bishop Cyril who was later made a saint. It is widely believed that the way Pulcheria governed the court is the reason why an environment where something like the murder of Hypatia was possible. In 416, Theodosius II came of age and took control of, as the Roman emperor in the east. In 419, the first edict issued by Emperor Theodosius II was given, and it was an order to his older sister Pulcheria to find him a suitable wife, and she came back with an Athenian woman named Athenaeus. She was from an elite family and had a well-known father, and even though the girl was a good match for Theodosius, she was still a pagan from a pagan family and the city of Athens. So she also had the name of a pagan goddess, Athena. So Pulcheria put Athenaeus into a Christian boot camp to get her ready to marry the emperor. In 421, Athenaeus graduated from the Christian boot camp and took the name Eudokia, and then married Theodosius II and became the empress of the Eastern Roman Empire. Empress Eudokia was a gifted person, and because of her intellectual upbringing as a pagan in Athens, she was familiar with all of the Greek classics. And when she took her studies in Christianity, she developed a unique style of writing Christian poetry in the language of the Homeric texts. We are really fortunate because some of her work survives today. Pulcheria was hoping that she would be able to control Eudokia, but it turns out that the opposite happened. Eudokia herself was a very strong woman, and this led to a rivalry between her and her sister-in-law. And to make matters even more complicated, Theodosius' aunt, who was married to a Gothic king in the west, came back to the court in Constantinople when her husband died. With Aunt Placidia in Constantinople, there were now three very strong, independent women who all believed they were the rightful empress. 
In 422, the Huns led a major incursion into Thrace as they crossed the Danube. Their hordes ravaged the countryside and even got close to Constantinople when the Romans sued for peace and offered to pay the Huns off with large sums of gold. In 423, the Western Roman Emperor died and a bureaucrat was elevated to Caesar. This put Emperor Theodosius in a tricky spot. Does he reunite the entire empire under his own banner, or does he appoint a proper emperor to the west? Ordinarily, it would be the desire of the Roman emperor to rule over the entire empire, but at this point in time, the west was a mess. And even if he did unite the empire, he would be responsible to defend it against the Germanic invasions and civil strife that was ripe in the western Roman empire, specifically in Gaul and Hispania. Ultimately, Theodosius II elevated his younger cousin to the rank of Caesar in the West. Emperor Theodosius wanted to crown his younger cousin in person and was on his way to Rome when he fell ill in Thessalonica and had to cancel his trip. And because of this, the Patriarch of Constantinople went in his place and crowned the young Valentinian III Emperor of the West. Now this was a perfect example of how the Church was gaining power. And a precedent was set where now the Patriarch could crown an Emperor. In 425, the University of Constantinople was founded. And it was meant to rival the schools in Athens and Alexandria. This school was important because the majority of the professors spoke Greek instead of Latin. In 430, Another incursion from the Huns led to Emperor Theodosius II agreement to pay the Huns an annual tribute to keep them from invading into Roman lands. Up until now, most of the Hunnic activity was across their borders, but they were now starting to breach the borders. The annual tribute kept the Huns at bay for a short period. In 434, the Hunnic king Rugula died and left the entire command of the horde to two brothers, Bleda and Attila. For the first few years of their reign, they negotiated with the Romans to return the Huns who defected to the imperial court so they could be executed at once. In 435, Bleda and Attila met with the imperial court and came to a settlement. The Romans returned all the Hun defectors in exchange and doubled the annual tribute. The Huns also returned all Roman prisoners of war in exchange for a ransom. The treaty also established Roman trading posts along the frontier so Huns could trade with the Romans while they focused their attention elsewhere. Through these trading posts, the Huns imported a lot of Roman wine. Bleda and Attila focused their armies east on the Persian Sassanid Empire. For the next five years, the Huns conducted raids into the Persian Empire but the Sassanids had a stronger defense against the Horde and were able to keep them at bay, although they suffered many casualties. The heaviest fighting occurred in the Kingdom of Armenia. In 438, the Vandals, who had been settled in southern Spain, crossed the narrow sea between Spain and Morocco and landed in North Africa and conquered all the way up to the walls of the wealthy Roman port city of Carthage. This was devastating for the Western Roman Empire, as it now lost all of its African provinces to the Germans. Meanwhile, back in Constantinople, Theodosius completed the Theodosian Law Code. These laws governed both halves of the empire. This law was important because up until now the Roman laws had just been amendments to existing laws, and it left the courts with a lot of redundancy and made precedents very confusing when they had centuries of overturned precedents. This new law illuminated this new law illuminated any of the old laws that were no longer practiced. This new law eliminated any of the old laws that were no longer practiced, and left a clean new set of laws that were easily understood throughout all of the courts in the empire. I imagine a lot of practicing lawyers were very upset with this because they were able to charge a lot more when the law was confusing. This was also the very last time the two halves of the empire would be governed by the same set of laws, as each emperor from here on out will add edicts to the law that do not transfer from east to west or vice versa. 
Eventually, the halves would evolve a completely different set of laws relating to the empire and the faith. In 439, Empress Eudokia went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and made several stops in Syria along the way. She made a famous speech in Antioch and gained so much favor with the people there that they built a statue in her honor. When she made it to Jerusalem, she visited all the holy sites and returned to the capital with several relics. This pilgrimage really elevated Empress Eudokia in the eyes of the church and the court of Constantinople, and it made Pulcheria extremely jealous of her. Life in the court of Constantinople grew very difficult between Empress Eudokia and her sister-in-law, Pulcheria. In 440, the Huns suffered a major defeat against the Sassanids in Armenia, and they focused their attention on the Eastern Roman Empire once again, raiding the very trading posts they helped establish in the Treaty of 435. In 441, instead of securing his northern border against the Huns, Emperor Theodosius II sent an army to North Africa to reclaim the land taken by the Germanic Vandals, leaving the Balkans devoid of Roman soldiers. This made it very easy for Bleda and Attila to ravage the Balkans and pillage the countryside, causing mass chaos and destruction in the already war-torn Roman province. This wasn't a careless decision to make either. The Vandals had just captured the city of Carthage, which was the source of most of their grain. It was a very tough decision to make, and perhaps Theodosius didn't know just how lethal the Hunnic horde really was. Or perhaps securing the food was more important. To make matters worse for the Eastern Empire, the Sassanids launched an invasion into the Eastern provinces. In 442, after seeing just how dangerous the Huns really were, the Roman Emperor recalled his troops to the mainland. He was so confident in the ability of his Roman soldiers that he refused every one of the Huns' demands. Because the Roman Emperor had snubbed the Huns, they regrouped and prepared for a full-scale invasion of the Eastern Roman Empire. In 443, Empress Eudokia left the capital for an extended pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Her bitter rival Pulcheria spread awful rumors about her in court, including a rumor that she had an affair with Theodosius' best friend and general, and as a result, he was executed. This rumor is extremely unlikely, though, given the history of Empress Eudokia, and was refuted by her until she died. These rumors end up in the historical record, but were most likely added by Pulcheria after everyone else died, as she lived longer than most of her contemporaries. Eudokia spent the rest of her life in Jerusalem doing charity and, and rebuilding the holy city. While she was in Jerusalem, she became a Monophysite Christian, which swayed from the traditional Nicene Creed of the Empire. However, it is said that Pope Leo swayed her back to the true faith, and she eventually became enshrined as a saint in the Greek Orthodox Church. When the Huns returned in 443, not only did they come with, with a mighty horde of horse archers, but they also brought with them battering rams and siege towers. Unlike the Goths that came before, the Huns were masters of siege warfare. They specifically attacked the cities housing the Roman garrisons and besieged the cities with deadly results. Priscus of Panium, a 5th century Greek historian and Roman diplomat, said, When we arrived at Nisus, we found the city deserted, as though it had been sacked. Only a few sick persons lay in the churches. We halted at a short distance from the river, in an open space, for all the ground adjacent to the bank was full of the bones of men slain in war. Still, the Huns continued deep into Roman territory, following the roads that led to Constantinople and sacking every city along the way, killing almost everyone they encountered, whether that be peasant or soldier or slave. Their war path took them right to the gates of Constantinople where their horde came face to face with the legendary Theodosian walls. It didn't matter how well they had gotten at siege warfare, they knew these walls were impenetrable. 
and they marched away from the capital and continued their raid into the empire. A second Roman army met the horde near the city of Gallipolis, modern-day Gallipoli. They didn't stand a chance against this horde. The Romans were encircled and shot to death by the thousands. In 444, the Hunnic king Bleda and his younger brother Attila came to terms with the Roman emperor, in which they were paid a hefty tribute every year in exchange for a peaceful withdrawal from Roman territory. The treaty forced the emperor to admit that it was his fault the Huns had invaded. The agreement was devastating to the Roman treasury, but at least it bought time for the empire to regroup and assess the damage done to their lands. In 445, while the Huns were riding away from Constantinople, it is assumed that Attila the Hun murdered his older brother and took sole control of the mighty Hunnic Empire. Attila was ruthless, even by Hunnic standards. When Hunnic princes returned from the Roman Empire who were sent there to learn their ways, Attila seized them and impaled them leaving them to die slowly on display for the rest of the horde to watch. And Roman spies caught in the ranks were tortured and killed. What made Attila the Hun a much more dangerous foe than any Hun who came before was that he wanted to evolve from a nomadic horde, raiding and pillaging and set up a Hunnic empire. No longer would raiding and vanishing back to the plains suffice. The Huns were here to stay. The plains the Huns began to settle into permanently lie in modern-day Hungary, but they had their eyes set on the whole of Europe. In 447, Attila gathered his army and struck the Eastern Roman Empire with the largest army he had yet to gather. The raiding hordes rode free through mainland Greece, destroying every city they came across. It is recorded that as many as 60 walled cities were destroyed during the campaign. They made it as far south as Thermopylae, and even marched on the great walls of Constantinople itself. In 448, with the Huns now centralized in Hungary, with their massive amounts of treasure and wealth, and an army consisting of tribes from all across northern Europe and the steppe, until the Hun now ruled over a proto-empire in direct opposition to the Roman emperors. Attila wore gold armor, and his soldiers were organized into an army rival to the other great powers of the world. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the History of Modern Greece. See you next time. Stay safe and stay awesome.